Um, two, two, one, two, check, two, okay. two. You did it, Kay, you did it. What'd you do? One, two, check, two, one, two. Thank you.
Check, check, check. One, two. One, two. Good? All right. Yep. Hello, I'm Terrence Days, owner of Skill at the Plate Soul Bistro, located here in York, PA, at 30 Eberts Lane. We're a soul food restaurant that specializes in Southern cuisine, comfort food. I was inspired to open a restaurant here in York just to, just to bring people together. Um, this is a town of different races and cultures and diversity, so it, I thought it would be cool to have a spot that everyone can come, just chill out and eat some great food. Well, I learned about the grant funding from Suli and Elaine. Um, they would come to the restaurant, talk to me when we first opened, um, and just letting me know about grants and funding that would be available to me. Um, and everything worked out. I used my funding from the grant by improving some of the things, pre-existing things in my restaurant, um, strengthening my staff, um, provide, in a restaurant, you always need new equipment, uh, money for payroll, utilities and bills and things like that. Uh, since we entered the recovery phase of COVID-19, things are starting to pick up. Um, during the whole process, COVID forced us to strengthen in some other areas like uh, delivery and takeout. So now that people are starting to come back out, it's all starting to mesh together and um, it's strengthening our business and caused us to uh, step our game up. The YCEA has helped with the whole process. Um, just even today, Sully had reached out to us um, about some paperwork that we missed. So they've been here with us every step of the way, uh, um, just calling, touching base with us, stopping through, um, making sure all our paperwork was in order and things like that to help the whole process, grant process go smoothly. So we definitely appreciate them for everything. Jacqueline's Bake Shop and Cafe in Hanover, PA. Um, we're working on our ninth year. Um, the shop just was very serendipitous in terms of um, it opening. There was a shop in this space that was closing and uh, this shop just kind of happened from 
what were you doing with the equipment and uh, what are you doing with the space and all that kind of stuff. So it was very serendipitous. It wasn't necessarily my plan since I was five years old, but um, it's been quite the blessing. ICEA um, helped us through this process in that it has eased a lot of our stresses, giving us that that peace of mind and, and to de-stress has lowered my blood pressure and, uh, and yeah, made this much, much easier. Most of our, our grant funding um, we used for rent because um, that didn't disappear with COVID. That was most of what it was allocated for, um, though I was able to give the, the two employees that I do have, um, I was able to give them small raises um, just because it is not easy for them right now either. Um, and uh, they're working extra hard and they, they care about the shop and our success as well. So I wanted to kind of pass that on a little bit. I actually learned of it through Main Street Hanover. Um, they had um, shared it uh, through their social media and, um, and then th I had seen it through a couple other social media um, things and we kind of jumped at the chance to, to apply, um, especially since we didn't qualify for some of the other loans and um, basically had no other help um, beforehand. So we were very thankful that there was another opportunity. We're surviving. Um, we're not thriving necessarily at the moment. Um, like this is kind of not the year to grow. This is the year to sustain, you know, life kind of. Um, and we, we're still here, we're, which is, I think, an amazing feat in itself. Um, we're not closing because of COVID, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're still here.
from both ends. Yep. Okay. Do you want me to check it? Check. There you go.
Good. One, two, three. Testing, testing. Hello, I'm Terrence Days, owner of Skill at the Plate Soul Bistro, located here in York, PA, at 30 Ebert's Lane. We're a soul food restaurant that specializes in Southern cuisine, comfort food. I was inspired to open a restaurant here in York just to, just to bring people together. Um, this is a town of different races and cultures and diversity, so it, I thought it would be cool to have a spot that everyone can come, just chill out and eat some great food. Well, I learned about the grant funding from Suli and Elaine. Um, they would come to the restaurant, talk to me when we first opened, um, and just letting me know about grants and funding that would be available to me. Um, and everything worked out. I used my funding from the grant by improving some of the things, pre-existing things in my restaurant, um, strengthening my staff, um, provide, in a restaurant, you always need new equipment, uh, money for payroll, utilities and bills and things like that. Uh, since we entered the recovery phase of COVID-19, things are starting to pick up. Um, during the whole process, COVID forced us to strengthen in some other areas like uh, delivery and takeout. So now that people are starting to come back out, it's all starting to mesh together and um, it's strengthening our business and caused us to uh, step our game up. The YCEA has helped with the whole process. Um, just even today, Sulia reached out to us um, about some paperwork that we missed. So they've been here with us every step of the way, uh, um, just calling, touching base with us, stopping through, um, making sure all our paperwork was in order and things like that to help the whole process, grant process go smoothly. So we definitely appreciate them for everything. Jacqueline's Big Shop and Cafe in Hanover, PA. Um, we're working on our ninth year. Um, the shop just was very serendipitous in terms of um, it opening. There was a shop in this space that was closing and uh, this shop just kind of happened from what, what are you doing with the equipment and uh, what are you doing with the space and all that kind of stuff. So it was very serendipitous. It wasn't necessarily my plan since I was five years old, but um, it's been a, quite the blessing. ICEA um, helped us through this process in that it has eased a lot of our stresses, giving us that that peace of mind and, and to de-stress has lowered my blood pressure and uh, and yeah made this much much easier. Most of our our grant funding um, we used for rent because um, that didn't disappear with COVID. That was most of what it was allocated for, um, though I was able to give the, the two employees that I do have, um, I was able to give them small raises um, just because that it's not easy for them right now either. Um, and uh, they're working extra hard and they, they care about the shop and our success as well. So I wanted to kind of pass that on a little bit. I actually learned of it through Main Street Hanover. Um, they had um, shared it uh, through their social media, and um, and then th I had seen it through a couple other social media um, things, and we kind of jumped at the chance to, to apply, um, especially since we didn't qualify for some of the other loans, and um, basically had no other help um, beforehand, so we were very thankful that there was another opportunity. We're surviving. Um, we're not thriving necessarily at the moment. Um, like this is kind of not the year to grow. This is the year to sustain, you know, life kind of. Um, and we, we're still here, we're, which is I think an amazing feat in itself. Um, we're not closing because of COVID, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're still here.
Hello, I'm Terrence Days, owner of Skill at the Plate Soul Bistro, located here in York, PA, at 30 Eberts Lane. We're a soul food restaurant that specializes in Southern cuisine, comfort food. I was inspired to open a restaurant here in York just to, just to bring people together. Um, this is a town of different races and cultures and diversity, so it, I thought it would be cool to have a spot that everyone can come, just chill out and eat some great food. Well, I learned about the grant funding from Suli and Elaine. Um, they would come to the restaurant, talk to me when we first opened, um, and just letting me know about grants and funding that would be available to me. Um, and everything worked out. I use my funding from the grant by Good evening, folks. We're going to get started shortly, so we encourage everybody to get um, in their vehicles staff, so you can um, provide, tune in to 87.9 FM uh, so that you can hear everything that we're discussing here. Like the that. way that we're going to listen uh, to the, the town hall is from our vehicles tuning in to 87.9 FM. We're going to get started shortly. Thank you for coming. It's all starting to mesh together and um, it's strengthening our business and caused us to uh, step our game up. The YCEA has helped with the whole process. Um, just even today, Sully had reached out to us um, about some paperwork that we missed. So they've been here with us every step of the way, uh, um, just calling, touching base with us, stopping through, um, making sure all our paperwork was in order and things like that to help the whole process, grant process, go smoothly. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for coming out, for taking the time on a Friday evening to be here with us in one of the most uh, important events of our democracy, right? Where we have the opportunity to talk to our elected officials. And we're going to be having a conversation today with U.S. Senator Bob Casey. My name is Thais Carrero. I'm the state director of CASA. And I'm honored to be here, honored to be your moderator today. Thanks again for coming out. I'm going to be laying out some of the ground rules that we're going to uh, be taking into consideration today. But before that, I also want to say welcome and thank you to some of our local electeds that are here today. Commissioner Doug Hoke, Mayor of York City, Michael Helfrich, and Councilwoman of West York, Mildred Tavares. Thank you so much for being here today. Before I welcome the senator to the stage, I, again, like I said, want to lay out some of the ground rules for this 60-minute event. Um, if you haven't done so, if, if you're out here, please jump into your vehicle and listen. Tune in to 87.9 FM so you can listen to everything that's being discussed today. Um, senator Casey and I will have our masks removed because we will remain six feet apart from each other. Uh, but everybody is encouraged to maintain social distancing and um, keep their masks on, please. Um, we want to get us to as many questions as possible. So we need everybody on the same page to make sure that we all know how this will work. This is the first time that we're doing this. Um, and we want to make sure that we continue to do so. And it needs to work today so that we can keep it going. Um, the center will begin with opening remarks on the political climate and the work he's doing for everybody here and in the state of Pennsylvania, some of the issues and the topics that he's paying close attention to. And then following that, we'll begin taking uh, questions from, from constituents. Please, we ask you to respect uh, the senator with, uh, with your, your questions. We please ask you that you limit shouting, uh, that you do not use any profanities or any unruly behavior, and we're going to be paying close attention to that. We know that the senator is going to respect you in the same way, um, so we ask uh, that you respect as well. And then you can see at the front of the stage, this event is open to the media, so by coming in, uh, you're acknowledging the use of your, um, your pictures and, and potential questions here in the media as well. So with that said, uh, I'm going to welcome Pennsylvania Senior Senator, Senator Bob Casey. Thais, thanks very much. Great job. Well, thanks, everyone. I guess we're, it's okay to take our masks off right here? Yeah. 
as long as we're, we're a little, even more than six feet away. But I want everyone to know, first of all, that I've got a Pennsylvania mask on, but I'm not sure that this version of it has a, a, a picture of York, so we're going to work on that for the next trip. But thanks, everyone, for being here. I know this is an unusual setting, obviously, for a town hall. We're grateful for the folks who have who are sitting in automobiles throughout this parking lot and grateful, of course, for the folks who are sitting up front here. I'm not going to talk at you because we want to do um, more than 95% of our time, we hope, on questions. But I did want to thank Penn State York for this opportunity. Um, and w Chancellor Christensen, I don't know if he's nearby, but we said hello on the way in. We're grateful for this opportunity. Uh, to be able to talk about some of the big issues that are confronting the country. This is both a time of challenge, obviously, because we have economic challenges and so many others, plus the pandemic that we hope we're putting behind us in the near term. But it's also a time for great opportunity to make investments in, in uh, our workforce and our infrastructure and our families to move the country forward. I'll just mention one issue that has uh, relevance to what we just did in the rescue plan, but even more significance in the next proposal that the president has outlined in his American Jobs Plan. And that's home and community-based services, known by, as everything is in Washington, an acronym, HCBS. Um, good way to remember it is as a network CBS. But home and community-based services, what are we talking about? We're talking about services in those settings for seniors and people with disabilities. Uh, we have millions of, a few million, I should say, millions of Americans who receive those services now, but the funding is capped. We don't really have the best program that we should have, and we want more people to be able to have those services. At last count, there were more than 800,000 Americans on waiting lists waiting to get those home and community-based services. Third point I'll make about this, in addition to helping seniors and people with disabilities, is uh, the investment the President wants to make would also lift up the caregiving workforce, the people who provide that essential, heroic care every day to seniors and people with disabilities. And that is, of course, um, low-income workers mostly women of color, making only $12 an hour. We have to make sure that we lift up those workers so they can provide the best care possible to those whom we love. So that's the only issue I'm going to put on the table because it's a big one. Uh, as It's a big issue as part of the next uh, infrastructure debate, but I'm sure we'll get to others in the course of the uh, discussion tonight. So let's open it up. Thais, I guess you're in charge of... Let's Call do it. On, Let's folks, do huh? it. We're going to have our first constituent, Shanna Danielson. If you can please step to the mic. Well, we got a stage here. That's great. <laughs> and you say, is it Shanna? It's Shanna, like banana. Yeah. Shanna, thanks. And this is Elliot. Hey, Elliot. How's it going? <laughs> and yeah, he wants to see himself on camera. We <laughs> live in Dillsburg in Northern York County. Okay. Um, my question is about gun violence prevention. So just within the last month, uh, including in McCungy just this week, Indianapolis, Atlanta, Bryan, Texas, South Carolina, a 16-year-old child here in York, not to mention police-involved shootings. Um, this gun violence is haunting us everywhere. It has been for decades, and it's a uniquely American problem. What actions? Uh, are being taken by the Senate to address gun violence. And also, um, as a mom's volunteer, I want to thank you for your support of this issue in the past. Well, Shanna, thank you, and thanks for bringing an issue to us that uh, so many Pennsylvanians, so many Americans are concerned about. And just the mention of places, as you just did, uh, recalls for people what happened in those places around the country, including here in Pennsylvania. Um, I think the short answer to your question is not enough. When you said, what's the Senate doing, uh, the short answer is not enough. Now, I can say the same about the House. The House of Representatives for several years now 
has uh, debated and then legislated on measures, common sense measures, to reduce the likelihood of gun violence. But the Senate has not acted. The Senate, the United States Senate, just think about this for a moment, supposed to be the greatest deliberative body in the world, has not really debated this issue in a real way, and certainly hasn't voted on a, on a series of proposals that have been put forward on background checks and so many others in the last, uh, really, eight years. Since 2013, when we had a long debate. We had a couple of votes that didn't, uh, that didn't result in passage. So the short answer is we're not doing enough. The good news is I think that's about to change. Uh, we have a majority in the Senate, a bare, bare majority, as you know, and we have a president who, and a vice president, both of whom care deeply about this issue and have spoken to it numerous times just in the time that they've been in office. So I think the, the days are a lot shorter now between today and when we have debates and votes on common sense gun measures. What I can predict for you, Shanna, is what, what will the result of those votes be? We, we have to work to get the votes to pass these measures to at least reduce the likelihood of more gun violence. It's not a magic wand. We know that. No bill, even a set of bills, a series of bills is not. But the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, we're, we're Americans. We take on big challenges throughout our history. Sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we haven't done enough. But when we take on a big challenge and are successful, it's because we don't surrender to the problem. By saying you we can do nothing, the greatest, most powerful country in the world can do nothing about gun violence, that is surrender. And if we're really the America we say we are, we're not going to surrender to gun violence. We're going to do something about it. Passing these common sense measures uh, is one step in the right direction. But thanks for the question. Thank you so much. We're going to go right up to the next constituent. Please introduce yourself, saying your name and where you're from, and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. Glad to see you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. My name is uh, Stephen Fries. I'm from Lancaster County. So I drove Stephen, over today. Good to be with you. Thank you. Well, so good far, we got two counties represented. That's right. <laughs> My question has to do with Medicare, mm -hmm. specifically, what can we do, what can you do to eliminate Medicare premiums and deductibles? Well, Stephen, one thing we've got to make sure we do uh, when it comes to Medicare is to try to make sure that we don't go in the wrong direction from where we are now. Medicare, like Social Security, is an earned benefit. Folks pay into it over time, and they should have the guarantee that, that Medicare sh must provide. So it's a guarantee, it's a promise, and we've got to make sure that we have the resources for it. What we don't want to have happen uh, is what some have proposed uh, for Medicare in Washington, and this isn't something new, this has happened over, these proposals have been made over time, to voucherize it, to turn Medicare into a voucher program, just like some people want to privatize or have private accounts for Social Security. Both are bad ideas, and we've got to stop it. Secondly, we've got to make sure that we have uh, the funding in place to, to make sure that we can fund both Medicare and Medicaid and, and other in critical uh, health care programs. Uh, in terms of completely wiping out uh, that kind of a, you know, th th those, those kinds of uh, costs, I'm not sure that's possible in the short run, but we have to figure out ways to get costs down as best we can, but we also have to make sure that we're using Medicare in an appropriate way to expand coverage. I think we should actually have um, folks uh, starting at the age of 50 to, to have the benefit of Medicare. There's legislation to do that that I've supported. Um, but, the, but the biggest battles on Medicare in the near term will be uh, funding battles, folks who want to cut it, folks who want to uh, voucherize it. That's where, that's where most of the battles are. But if there's a, a bill or a proposal that you want us to look at, look at I hope you uh, get in touch with us. As I know, I think I'm pretty sure everyone here has a way to contact us in the information you were given uh, before the uh, the town hall. But thank you for your thank you for your question, and uh, please say hello to everybody in Lancaster County. I will. Thank you, and I will follow up. Thanks. Thank you so much. Question number three. Please say your name, and where are you from? 
Good afternoon, Senator. My name is you? Joyce Santiago, a resident of York City, York County, Pennsylvania. Hey, Joyce. Nationwide, there is a shortage of nearly 7 million affordable and available homes for the lowest income renters. In York County, there are 31 affordable and available rental homes for every 100 extremely low income renter households. Affordable Housing Advocates has long since supported increasing equitable access to sustainable, affordable housing for low income individuals. With that being said, our community's demand for housing far outweighs our number of available properties. What support do you aim to provide to organizations like ours across the state? Well, Joyce, it's a great question because one of the biggest challenges in the midst of this pandemic has been the, the two related issues you talked about, both, uh, both paying for rent, being able to make, make your rental payments, but also housing itself more broadly, affordable housing. Both of these issues have been addressed uh, I think in, in, a, in a, frankly, in, in a limited way in a, in a, over the course of a series of uh, COVID bills that the, the Congress passed. The, the most recent bill, the American Rescue Plan, which is the last bill that will be related to the public health emergency, COVID, that bill made a tremendous investment to help both renters as well as to invest more in housing. But I think the housing part, uh, which is, I think, most of what your question deals with. Um, the housing investment, I think, is going to have to be the subject of what we do in the jobs plan that the president has proposed, and he's got a very detailed proposal about the, the summary alone is about 30 pages, more, a little more than 30, but the legislation is not written yet. So what we've got to do is take his proposal, get it into legislative language, put it in a bill, and make sure that we have the kind of robust investment in affordable housing that, the, that President Biden and Vice President Harris have, uh, have, have articulated. But that, that's going to take some legislative work to get us there. But I hope we can follow up with you if you think there's a, uh, a particular uh, local need in York, in the city of York, that you hope we could, we could fund uh, by virtue of a major initiative in, in, uh, in, or I should say a major investment in affordable housing. Thank you, sir. We look forward to working with you on it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very much needed. We're going to continue going. This is great because we want to get to as many questions as we can as possible. Yeah. So let's just keep it going. Please say your name and where are you from? Good afternoon, Senator. I'm Anis Raman, and you probably know my face many times. I have bothered you in the DC. And uh, good to see you over here. Thank you for coming down uh, to see the constituents in this central and south, central, uh, south Pennsylvania, sure. York area. We are in Harrisburg. Uh, so my question to you is regarding the infrastructure. You mm -hmm. probably know I am one of the experts uh, among the handful of them in the country as well as all over the world, is um, our infrastructure, roads, highways, and bridges are being built and rebuilt and rebuilt. I sent you a letter to your office uh, rebuilding Greener America, and you were so kind to respond to me, but it didn't respond actually. So I'm following okay. up on that. Uh, as you know, that every few years we have to rebuild our roads and highways and bridges in this country, and of course, all over the world. So I think that the senior senator from the US, uh, from the Pennsylvania, has the opportunity to be the leader to show the country as well as the world that we can do a better job. The nanotechnology that we have developed and all over the world, scientists are putting this forward in uh, that I uh, <clears throat> mentioned in, in my letter to you, that will make the roads last four to five times longer than compared to the current material and current way of being built. And so not only that, it also uh, lower the rate of accidents because of the better material properties. Okay. So my question to you that will you be the leader to lead this uh, opportunity for the whole country and, and what will you do for that? Well, first of all, could, could you walk through a little bit about what, what you hope we would do? Yeah, yes, I, I mentioned in my letter that some legislative initiatives need to be taken because living on the private sector, 
it may or may not come so soon because right. it's not a popular item. Right. Uh, so um, I'm now, I'll be happy to follow up on that and write more in details to your office. Okay. Um, but but that some legislative action need to be taken. Well, there's no question that the the next d big debate now, and we've already commenced it, is on uh, infrastructure. Not only roads and bridges and broadband and the electricity grid and water and sewer and stormwater, you go down a long, long list, but also the uh, caregiving infrastructure that I just mentioned. But in terms of roads and bridges, I was just looking at a, a summary uh, that was, was uh, articulating the various uh, infrastructure needs just of Pennsylvania and then what the president had proposed. And I think the number for roads that needed repair in the state was about 7,700. I'm going to have it here somewhere. Um, and the number of bridges were more than 3,300 that, that need repair. Let me just double check what I just said. 75, I'm sorry, not 77. 7,540 miles of highway in poor condition in our state. And that's, that ratio or number is probably not any different in other states. 3,353 bridges that are also in poor condition. And again, that's true in, in virtually every state. Each driver in a state like ours is paying $620 per year in costs due to, to driving on roads that are in need of repair. So that's, that's the, the problem, or, or a summary, quick summary of the problem. What the president proposes is to devote $600 billion to transform the nation's uh, transportation infrastructure including $115 billion for uh, roads and bridges. So they're big numbers when you talk about just for roads and bridges, $115 billion. I think finally we have a, uh, a, a focus by a president, a, a uh, piece of legislation which is still in formation but is going to move. And we're going to vote on this one way or the other. We, we want to get an infrastructure bill that has Democrats and Republicans supporting it, but I'm not going to support something that's scaled down. We, we have to go big. Uh, we haven't invested in our infrastructure in more than 50 years. Some think it's longer than that. And this is a great opportunity. So I'm doing my part to push the whole agenda. Now, some of us are working on various parts of it. But there's no question that I'm going to be fighting hard for those dollars for, for Pennsylvania, both with, with respect to roads and bridges and other basic, uh, uh, basic infrastructure. And I'll make sure that, um, I know you sent the one letter that we responded to, but I'll make sure that uh, we stay in touch with you about, about the ideas that you have. And uh, if I may mention that, I'll be very happy to follow up on this. I have bigger documents. There's a group of people we are working together, yep. some 125 scientists all over the country. So um, I would like to send the document to you if that's okay with you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming down from Dauphin County. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. For those of you who have just joined us, uh, the way that we're listening to this clearly is tuning in to 87.9 FM in your car to make sure that we are safely, right, physically distanced. Um, so if you are here, if you just got here and you are inside your vehicle but just listening to the speaker here, there's a more efficient way to do it, and it is tuning in to 87.9. We're going to keep going. Next question, please. Say your name and where are you from. Good evening, Senator. How are you? Hi. Um, I'm Carrie Ann Perolio. I am a York County resident and also Vice President of Strategic uh, Initiatives at Family First Health. We're a, fam a federally qualified health center that's been around for about 50 years, Great. serving our communities uh, and providing comprehensive primary care to patients. At Family First Health, we really appreciated your support of the American uh, Rescue Act. The act delivered much needed resources to federally qualified health centers and uh, throughout Pennsylvania, York, uh, specifically us, um, and also the country. And it allowed us to continue to keep our doors open and serve very vulnerable patients at this point. Um, much more is needed in addition to this act. And we want to be able to ensure that our uh, health care advances that we made during the pandemic will continue on past this point. 
Um, as the Biden administration, House and Senate negotiate an infrastructure bill, it's critical that the bill continues to allow us to be able to perform telehealth encounters and also be able to bill for those encounters. Um, that also includes audio. A lot of our patients don't have access to uh, video or have an uh, inability to access platforms, and so telephone contact was really critical to keep in contact last year with them. Um, the other uh, piece of this funding that would be critical is that expansion of broadband access across the country. Uh, so uh, how critical do you feel it is for us to uh, ensure the access of telehealth for our patients and also broadband access? Oh, thanks. Did, now, did I hear your name right? Carrie Ann. It's Carrie Ann, yes. Thank very much. Well, thanks for the work you do in healthcare and especially at, uh, at one of our health centers. It's, I think it's in some ways one of the the gems of our healthcare system that we don't talk about enough. So the, the, the federally qualified health centers across the country provide uh, healthcare to tens of millions and uh, we, we probably don't um, highlight it enough. Thanks for mentioning what has already been done, but as you said, we need to do more. And as much as we learned throughout the pandemic some horrible lessons about what wasn't working, um, you know, folks who were uh, disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Communities of color got hit harder than uh, folks like me uh, in terms of the, the case numbers, the death numbers, the inability to access quality health care. So many, so many terrible lessons we had to learn. Uh, one good lesson we learned is that telehealth works, telehealth is necessary, and telehealth should be continued. So we have to we have to make sure, and I, I don't have tonight a, a precise formulation of what we should do, but I, there's no question that we're going to have to work n not just in, a, in terms of funding or appropriations, but potentially to keep in place policies to telehealth that were uh, put in place for the public health emergency, the pandemic, uh, to continue. I know you know more about that than I do. Um, but I think that was one of the surprises, really, that uh, we could provide the kind of health care access that's needed by way of, uh, by way of telehealth. So, th th as you know, there are really kind of three, three buckets here in a sense. The, the President has proposed the American Jobs Plan. That's already on the table. We haven't written the legislation yet. That'll take, you know, the next few months to, to write and then have, we hope we have votes on that maybe this summer. I hope early in the summer rather than later. The second proposal, which he will start, he begin to talk about this week when he gives his State of the Union address, that will be the American Families Plan. And that's going to deal with a whole range of issues. And I'm not going to list them because it's not, it's not final yet. And, and all we know is uh, some potential items that would be in there. Um, I think that's, there's some potential for the idea you're talking about there. And then the third kind of general area, I'd say, would be when we get to uh, the the budget or, or really the appropriations process for uh, health and human services, CMS, all of the you know the, the agencies that are dealing with health care every day, and that's where of course policy and appropriations will come to, will be you know the, those questions will be brought to bear. So what we will do is uh, as as we uh, have your information tonight, or you contact us, we'll stay in touch with you to to walk through what could happen and what you what you hope would happen in this process, either as part of the, the infrastructure initiatives or, or in just the, you know, the annual appropriations process. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I put my mask on this. It's, it's oh, it flew over. Okay, I'll get it. I'll grab it. Teresa's going to grab it. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I should just hold it in my pocket. That might, Thank you so much. How are we feeling? It's, it's a little bit hard to kind of like keep a pulse of how everybody's feeling with everybody in their cars. Yeah. But if you could potentially, I don't know, light your, your flash your lights or anything to make sure that everything is that's sounding great. well, that's great. Okay. <laughs> Good to hear. Good to hear. Thank you every, so much. It's, it's a Thais, little bit chilly, how, but how about every car that beep, we send them a pizza. Can we do that? Oh, <laughs> look at that. Let's, let's hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs>
I wish it's it, a little bit chilly, but it's better than yesterday, right? It's got to be better than snow, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let's keep going. Melissa, go ahead. Well, I feel like I'm like coming on the party here, Thais. <laughs> Um, so good evening, Senator. How are good you? Good evening. Good. Good to be with you. My name is Melissa Plotkin, and I'm a resident here in Spring Garden Township, and I'm a lifelong York County resident. And I want to thank you for your ongoing support for our citizens returning to society from incarceration. I serve as the ex executive director of the York County Reentry Coalition, and one of the biggest oh. opportunities that we see for our communities like ours is to provide pathways for these individuals to enter the workforce and meet the needs of many employers looking for their labor force. So what proposals do you have around this realm to support reentrance as our country embarks on recovery? Well, thanks for doing that work. That is work that, frankly, Washington hasn't been focused nearly enough on for uh, for many, many years. And it's only recently become the subject of uh, more policy debate, more focus in terms of what, how do we how do we invest in and how do we lift up returning citizens? Part of what we've got to do, I think, is to make sure that when someone has served their time, that they still have opportunities like the right to vote um, and have opportunities to to not have that sentence that they served drag them down for the rest of their lives. Uh, one kind of related issue that I'm working on, it actually has a, uh, a bipartisan co-sponsor in the Senate, uh, it's called the Clean Slate Act. And what we're trying to do there is to have, when someone has served their, uh, served their sentence, we want to make sure that if they have uh, a low-level federal drug offense, like simple possession of marijuana or something like that, that they can have uh, that record sealed so it doesn't follow them or haunt them when they, when they go to, to get a loan or, in some cases, they're so young and they're, they're applying for... Um, you know, for student aid to get to further their education. So that's one kind of related issue I've been working on directly. But in terms of um, a, a strategy uh, for returning citizens, I don't think there's really nearly enough of one. I know there are a number of proposals that, um, that, that some have moved forward, but I do think that this is the kind of year when we're thinking about, you know, bigger agenda items than sometimes Washington does, I feel like the last couple of years in the Senate, all we've done is confirm federal judges. That's not a great way to, they're important, we got to do it, but we ought to be legislating more on, on big issues. Fortunately, we, we're off to a good start with the rescue plan, but a lot more to do. But let me ask you this, if you don't mind me asking you, what would you hope we would do just in the next year or two? What would be most beneficial uh, so that folks who are returning can uh, re-enter society and be productive and, and successful? Wow, you, <laughs> you're asking me a question. Um, you know, I, I think the bottom line is when, um, when individuals leave and um, they're putting, trying to put that behind them, that yeah. they're seen as like everyone else's and they have their humanity. So having the ability mm -hmm. to do what everyone else is able to do, whether it's vote, um, to be, you know, access housing, affordable, equitable housing, yep. um, health care, um, and the treatments that they need when they leave incarceration. Um, I think, you know, there's, I could throw everything at you to, you know, in terms of that, but I think one of the biggest needs we see here in York County, and I don't know, Thais, if you could even jump in on this, is, is housing. I mean, housing mm -hmm. is a huge need uh, that we're seeing across the board, not just for reentrance, yep. but in general, for everyone. Well, Affordable housing. It just came up, you know, it came up. Uh, Twice tonight already, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it, because I only asked you because you're you're um, an expert in this, you've studied it, you've spent some time on it here in New York, so it's in the county. So I appreciate you doing that. If we can stay in touch with our team, that would be uh, wonderful. We'll see. That what, what I don't know is whether, and I'll have to check whether there's a bill that that in a kind of comprehensive or strategic way addresses um, a menu of things we, mm -hmm. we we'd want to do for returning citizens. We're working on a, a grant application now to help with case management. So okay. I believe that's also a huge need in terms of um, having a plan in place so that when they leave, they're not just 
left with nothing, you know, with no opportunities, with, uh, whereas they would have an opportunity uh, to work with a manager to help them address any of the issues, any of the needs that they might have moving forward uh, to make them more successful and, you know, saving money for, uh, for our community, um, but reinvesting it in, um, in, the, in wonderful ways like that. Yep. Well, thank you, Melissa. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go right up to the next question. Please say your name and where are you from? While we're transitioning here, let me just make one commercial here. Um, many of you will have a, a two-page kind of a back and front summary of the American Rescue Plan. That is obviously a broad summary uh, walking through some of the highlights of, of this. Um, I think probably the most important piece of domestic legislation in the last 25 years in my judgment. And there's so much to it, we could spend all night talking about it. And that's not even getting to the next proposal, the jobs plan. But, but the American Rescue Plan, just for York County, $165 million, just from the American Rescue Plan. When you add up the dollars that will go to York County government, I saw Commissioner Hoke back there somewhere, and also when you add up all the municipalities within the county that will benefit, the total for the county uh, is just a little bit north of 164, almost 165 million dollars. I wanted to make sure I added that commercial, but sorry to hold you up. No, that's fine. Thank you very much for that information. That's good to know. Uh, thank you for coming to York today. My name is Katie Weaver. Hey, Katie. I actually live just down the road here, York Township in York County. Mm -hmm. um, my question is a little shorter than the last ones, but uh -huh. just as difficult. How are we going to overcome the divisiveness in our country so that we can recover from this pandemic? Well, Katie, I think we're going to need enough five hours to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I, part, of it is, part of it is working together. Not only people always talk about working together in, in, in Washington in a, in, a, in a legislative sense, but I think all of us have to try to, to do the same thing in our own communities. We can all be part of this uh, solution. Um, the, some rules I try to follow, and I haven't, I, I can't say that I follow them all the time and I haven't violated these rules. I have, for sure. I'm a politician, I've run for public office, I've, I, I've served in public office, so it, um, we, we get into some, some fights. But I think w one thing we can do is to try to figure out a way to say, what are the basic challenges our, our society faces, and what are we going to do about it? That's one way to try to arrive at some common ground. Um, I don't think, I don't care what side of the political divide you're on or where, whether you're involved in politics and, and debate about issues or not, I think most Americans would agree that we got to do everything we can to move forward on, on uh, getting the, the, uh, uh, as many vaccinations as possible and putting the pandemic behind us. If we, if we put this pandemic behind us, mostly because of vaccinations, but a lot of other things that people have been doing all year. Uh, that's kind of the linchpin for everything else. So if we get that done, um, I think we can begin to bring the country together. And most people, I think, agree with that. The second thing I think most people agree on is that our economy is in rough shape, right? Uh, fortunately, the unemployment rate is going down, but we know that doesn't always tell the story. Uh, we still have a lot of counties in Pennsylvania. Now, your county is not one of them. Last time I checked, your unemployment rate here is 6.3, but that's 6.3 for, I think that's a February number. That's um, higher than it was certainly a couple years ago, or even a year, maybe a, a year and a half ago, that when it was uh, between maybe four and a half and five. So unemployment is high everywhere. Uh, all kinds of other indicators about the economy being in a ditch, we've got to lift it out of the ditch. It's like a car that went off the road and is in the ditch you got to figure out a way to push the car out of the ditch. Uh, and even when it's out of the ditch, you got to make sure it can kind of cruise on down the road. So we've got a lot of work to do to get that car out of the ditch and, and move it down the road. I think most people agree that that's the right thing to do. Now, where we differ or disagree is how to do that. That's where the, the debate comes and the political divide. But I think if we can try to at least talk about issues, even if you're not going to tell your neighbor where you stand on an issue, just talking about what, what they, you know, what you hope we'd be working on or what, 
what issues uh, one of your neighbors thinks, at least we can agree on the, the scope and the severity of the problem. Second thing is, and again, we, it's hard to do this in political debate, it gets, it gets heated, is not to be categorical in your assessments of another person or your even a, a denunciation of their point of view or their argument. In other words, if I'm in the Senate or even in, in, my, you know, in my community, if someone says, well, you're doing the wrong thing and I don't like what you're doing and I'm against you on this issue or that, the worst thing for me to do would be to say, well, you're wrong on that policy issue and you're also a bad person, and then add more to that. In other words, draw the line of disagreement on a policy, but don't personally attack and, and put that person in a category uh, or, 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 or uh, be, you know, be that, you know, that confrontational. So that's, that helps a lot because if, if we're not insulting each other personally, we can still have vigorous disagreements and say, you're wrong, no, I'm not, the back and forth that's part of our society without, without making it a lot worse by having personal insults. So I think if we can follow some of those basic rules, we'll be, uh, we'll be in better shape. But look, I was very critical yesterday. I would just be up front with you. The, the Re Republicans came up with a proposal after President Biden said we need to spend uh, roughly two and a half trillion dollars on this American jobs plan and they came back with a plan that was about 568 I think was the number uh, billion dollars they they completely eliminated the proposal on home and community based services so I was, I was pretty angry about that and I said so and I disagree with them but I, tr I didn't say they're bad people so <laughs> that's progress right um, but I think that's part of it. I think we, we've got to figure out a way to say, okay, at least agree that this is this particular issue we're talking about is a problem, and then we can debate about how to get there. But it's not easy. We're we're a society that's always been uh, had political divisions, but we got to try to we got to try to breach the divide and and bring people together. Thank you very much. And just as an FYI, I've had my two shots, so I appreciate all the vaccines getting out Great. of the community and. I can get back into public again. That's Thank great. You. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. And thanks for being here tonight. Please say your name and where are you from? Hi. My name is Patricia Fonzi. Hey, I'm Patricia. from York City. I'm uh -huh. the president and CEO of the Family Health Council of Central PA. Uh -huh. And first, I'd just like to say a special thank you to Senator Casey for always being willing to talk to his constituents. You know, this is, I've been to multiple open forums with you over the years, and I just really have appreciated your willingness to let people get up here, ask questions, and have dialogue. Um, so today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about a program that I know you love and support as part of the safety net, and that's the WIC and SNAP programs. Yep. So uh, my organization, we run the WIC program and the SNAP program in about 11 counties in central Pennsylvania. And in never in the history, I think, of these programs have we seen the critical need for safety net programs, that uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 has stressed these programs really to the limit and while we've done amazing things and been able to really turn things on a dime and get amazing results, I know there's more that we could be doing to support those programs and engage more families in them and uh, the word on the street is you have some plans for that as well and I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit about what you think could be next for those projects. Oh, well thanks so much and I, Patricia I appreciate the work you do um, for families because that work, I don't think, has ever been more important, ever been more consequential than it is right now. Uh, we've lived through one hell of a year, as you know, and families, so many families were, were suffering, uh, frankly, a lot more than I was. I was, I was blessed, um, and I think anyone who has the following is really blessed. I was, I was healthy. I, didn't, I di wasn't hospitalized or had any major health issues. I had a job. And my family was not uh, uh, was not uh, you know uh, a victim of this virus, so I was really lucky. A lot of families didn't have that. Some of them, as you, many of them, uh, had a loved one with the virus. Some lost a loved one. Some may have lost their their job or or a small business or housing or so many other challenges. 
So the work you're doing for those families has never been more important. Secondly, with regard to the two programs you mentioned, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, we used to call it food stamps, but now it's got a new name over the last, I guess, 20 years or so. Um, but that program is always vitally important, but it was ever more so in the pandemic because the, the food, you know, the, the term in Washington is food insecurity. That doesn't sound all that bad until you realize what it means. That means people are hungry. 50 million Americans before the, the rescue plan. That was the number that, that uh, was calculated. 50 million Americans not having enough to eat. And a huge percent of them uh, are children. Uh, children in, in our state, a huge percent uh, still are hungry. As is true in a lot of states in the country. So we had to make a, a new investment in the SNAP program. Now, the problem was we had this CARES Act in March of 20 and did a lot of good things. Helped small business, helped a lot of communities, gave people a, a check, it helped unemployment. It was, it was a really good piece of legislation. It was passed 96 to 0 in the U.S. Senate. That never happens, right? The problem was, though, a big gaping hole in that CARES, CARES Act was not an increase in the SNAP program, not enough food assistance in that program. So people like me, uh, as soon as that bill passed, and we, I voted for it, but I wanted more food assistance. So in April of 20, in May, in June, in July, all throughout the year, we kept yelling and proposing, <laughs> yelling about more SNAP assistance and proposing, and the other side kept saying no, 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 no. Finally, in December, we got a 15% increase in SNAP, uh, for SNAP beneficiaries. We had been asking for that really since March or April of 20. The December uh, policy is going to be extended by virtue of the rescue plan we just passed. So that will extend through uh, September, I think, if I'm right about that. So that's a big help to SNAP. But we've got to make sure that just because the pandemic might be in the, in the rearview mirror, we hope, in a few months. We're not sure, but we hope. Uh, food assistance will still be essential. So we got to keep fortifying the SNAP program. The SNAP program, I like to say, helps every single American. And some people say, what are you talking about when you say that, that it helps every single American? I thought it was just for someone who's eligible for food assistance and is hungry, right? No, but it helps all of us because SNAP, and our, ask Mark Zandi from Moody's. He's, he's not, you know, he's a, a nonpartisan um, uh, economist. Mark Zandi and others have pointed to the bang for the buck of SNAP. You spend a dollar and you get a buck, you know, a dollar seventy in return when you spend money. Because guess what? When someone gets a SNAP benefit, they're highly, highly likely to spend it very quickly to buy food because they have to eat. It's kind of basic. Uh, that, if, that impacts the economy in a very positive way. So I like to say that SNAP isn't about some limited group of Americans over here. SNAP is about all of us. Now, even if it didn't benefit the economy, I think we'd, we'd want to uh, invest in that program. Last point I'll make is on WIC, the Women, Infants, and Children program. So vital. The rescue plan uh, added uh, funding for, for WIC. What I'd like to do, though, and I've had legislation the last couple of years, and it's a really interesting name. I call it the WIC Act, right? That was really, that was really creative. <laughs> But the, the, what we're trying to do there is extend the eligibility for, instead of capping it off at five-year-old children, we want to extend that to up to the age of six. Because there are a lot of children that get caught in that, 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 that last year where they're not in school and, and they, they, they're moving on to the next grade and they, they can sometimes be, um, don't have the opportunity to get WIC benefits. So we're trying to add to that, so enlarge the program a little bit but the funding for WIC is every bit as vital as the funding for SNAP. So thanks for asking about bo thanks. both programs. Before we actually go to the next question, because this is a first, um, we also have folks listening at home. So I have a question here from Karen from Adams County. I'm a teacher and this pandemic has been devastating for me personally and professionally. How can the American Rescue Plan dollars improve my schools, and when will our schools start to see start to see the dollars? 
Did you say her name is Karen? Karen from Adams, Adams County. Adams County. So we got another county represented. Karen, I hope you can hear my voice. Um, the, the rescue plan in total for um, K through 12 education provided $126 billion. And there are several more billion for other levels of education. But K through 12 is 126. The reason why we needed that dollar amount is to open schools safely. Um, there, are, there are some politicians in Washington that were kind of preaching and pointing, right? They're preaching about opening schools, telling school districts and educators and others, you got to open your schools and, and kind of pointing the finger at them. But those same politicians didn't vote for the rescue plan, didn't vote for the $126 billion to open schools safely, operative word there being safely, because it, to open a school safely, you need more room. You need ventilation, you need personal protective equipment, you need a lot of expenses. And last time I checked, school districts, just like county government and other levels of government, can't print money. So we, the federal government was the only show in town, the only entity of our, go of our government that could provide that, those extra dollars. Um, so that, th those dollars will be helping school districts all across our state. Just to give you a sense of the scale of this, uh, Pennsylvania alone is going to get, last number I saw was about four, little more, almost $5 billion, a little more than $4.9 billion just for uh, education dollars. The last thing she asked about was when. I think the timing of that, I'm not sure whether that will land this, you know, th this spring, early summer, whether it will land in the, the fall for the beginning of next year's school year. But I will check that and I have a crack staff here who might be able to get us an answer in, in real time. But good question. Thank you, Karen from Adams. Thank you for tuning in. Next question, please say your name. Where are you from? Great. Senator Casey, Aaron Anderson. I am a dad of six kids here in York City. It's good to see you again. Thanks, Aaron. Good to be and, with you. Uh, and I'm the CEO of a school here that serves about two-thirds of our kids. It's called Logos Academy. Two-thirds of our kids are kids that live in poverty. So mm -hmm. I want to ask you a follow-up question on that school-related question uh -huh. about the disparities our kids are specifically seeing. So in York City, we have a 46 percent poverty rate for kids in New York City. Um, a recent study, Harvard Connected study, put out in October, ranked York City as a top five most under-resourced cities among 450 cities studied in the country. Hmm. We were worse than De Detroit. And the issue, the central issue, is the concentration of poverty. Now, the pandemic, if anything, it just exposed cracks and flaws and, and systemic issues that were, that were there before. We know that American cities, specifically right here in Pennsylvania, have been abandoned, they've been isolated, they've been uh, segregated, and we have left our most disenfranchised neighbors um, sort of out in the cold. And here in the city, you've heard a couple of questions around affordable housing. You know, we, we have become, we have become, the city has become the bearer of affordable housing and social services. And quite frankly, we're choked and starved of resources to even really help in that. So while I'm uh, grateful for the American Rescue Act and, and, and much that, it, that I, I realize that it's doing, I do wonder what other measures could be done to address the concentration of poverty that is just literally destroying our cities? Well, it's a great question. I didn't hear... I, that's a good that's a good endorsement of your question. I didn't hear your first name. I'm sorry. Aaron. Oh, Aaron. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know we've met. But Aaron, uh, you, you've got your, your finger on a, a huge issue, which is poverty itself. And we've never really had, in my judgment, at least in terms of federal government policy, a, an anti-poverty strategy. I know in the 60s, uh, President Johnson uh, had a war on poverty, but that that effort began to to be sidetracked um, not long after, and certainly by the 1980s, it was all but gone. Um, so it, it, I think it starts with some of the investments we made uh, in the rescue plan. For example, the child tax credit. We know that by virtue of this one bill, the rescue plan, because the child tax credit is greatly expanded, because the earned income tax credit is also greatly expanded, and because, and I, work, I worked on the other two, but in particular had a bill on this one, the third tax credit, kind of a three-legged stool, was the child and dependent care tax credit, which is a tax credit for families to be able to help them pay for child care. Those three tax credits 
in addition to the help from SNAP, the increase that I just mentioned, and other proposals or other uh, provisions, uh, allowed us to be able to say, based upon the academic studies, that this American Rescue Plan would reduce child poverty by one half. No bill in 50 years has been able to do that. Now, the, the challenge, though, is to continue those really anti-poverty strategies, those tax credits. They're not the only thing we should be doing, but they're a, lot, they're a big part of it. So, for example, the, the child tax credit is going to benefit 90 percent of Pennsylvania's children. Uh, I don't know the exact number for York City and, and York County, but it's probably hovering around that number because the number tends to go up when it comes to, to uh, cities. So continuing those strategies is one big part of it. But if we cut it by 50 percent and we maintain those provisions beyond one year, 50 percent is wonderful, but let's keep going. Um, so the tax credits are part of it. I think secondly, We've got to make sure that w we think about other ways to lift up and support families with children. You said you had six children. Um, Aaron, that's a, that's a hell of an achievement <laughs> for, <my laughs> Being, <wife. laughs> for your wife. And I know you, played, you play some role, but, but um, that's, I mean, I, I just can't imagine uh, what some families are dealing with every day of the week, just trying to pay for uh, everything from child care to groceries to, you know, the, the basic needs that they have. So I, I, my short, I guess my short answer is we've got a good start on an anti-poverty strategy. I still think it needs to be amplified. For example, in the American Families proposal the President's about to unveil, and I don't know anything that's not in the paper, but it's likely, I think, that that proposal will include more help for pre-kindergarten education, uh, early learning, more help for, you know, continuation of help for child care more help for these programs that lift up families because one of the best ways to reduce poverty over time is to invest in children. I, I put out a proposal, and I'll end with this, in early 2020, the Five Freedoms for America's Children, based upon Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms for the Human Race. But these five freedoms involve, I think, the elements of an anti-poverty strategy for, for children. The freedom to learn. Every child should be given uh, early learning. They shouldn't have to wait until they get to first grade they, or, or even kindergarten. They should get pre-kindergarten pre education. Now I say everyone, I mean every child, every single child should have that opportunity. They should also have the, the freedom to be healthy. Uh, every child should have health care. I think we should enroll every child. If a child is, if the family of that child is uninsured when that child's born in a hospital, we ought to enroll them in Medicaid. If the parents want to opt out and keep them on the, their employer coverage or do something else. But let's get every child covered. We still got, I think in our state, still we have between 120 and 130,000 kids still that don't have health insurance, despite the CHIP program and Medicaid and all these other initiatives. So getting every kid covered, making sure kids aren't hungry, making sure that they're protected from those who would do them harm, and giving kids, the, la the, the fifth, is giving them a start on a secure economic future. Every child born in America should have a savings account that, that uh, the federal government helps them with by just putting, putting in some money initially, $100 per kid when they start, or some, some number like that. So I think if we concentrate on these supports for children, we're going to short term and long term especially reduce uh, childhood poverty, but also begin to reduce poverty overall. But Aaron, thanks for your work, and um, hope we can talk more about uh, the school. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're approaching the end here. We have our last three questions by three very powerful women that I am honored to know. So, Great. adelante, Tanisha. Gracias. Good evening, Good Senator evening. Casey. Tanisha Fuentes. I live in West Manchester Township in York County with a deep love for the city of York. Um, so kind of just piggybacking off of topics, poverty, how it's impacting inner city, right. um, education, I would like to know, um, considering that disadvantaged communities have been especially hard hit by the economic impact of the pandemic, there are still record numbers of unfilled 
jobs, especially in our area. How will you support programs that create pathways specifically for disadvantaged job seekers to build careers working with the new technologies that are revolutionizing, I would say, across industries? Yep. Well, one of the things that we've got to do, and this, this has been the subject of some work in Washington over really the last 25 years, um, and we continue to learn lessons about it, and that's kind of, kind of housed under one big word, workforce, or two words, workforce development. Um, and we're going to be spending more time on that just in the next couple of months in the, the relevant Senate committee is the HELP Committee, Health, Education, Labor, Pensions. HELP is going to be working on this uh, again. Every couple of, well, I'd say maybe every five or so, or sometimes longer, we, we end up reauthorizing the program, the, the workforce uh, development programs across the country. And the places like the city of York and York County and a lot of counties throughout our state have workforce investment boards and they have a strategy where employers and academic institutions and others are, who know the most about the workforce in a county are, are come together on a regular basis. So I think we have to continue focusing on those kinds of strategies Within a county or within a region, there's there's an effort to link a job uh, with an individual who's out of work, making sure they have a skill level that matches the openings. And sometimes that mismatch between uh, skill level over here and a job over there is is a con continues to be a problem. But I think none of that is going to work unless we have these supports underneath that I just talked about a moment ago: supports for children, supports for families. Um, but it's it's a I think it has to be the subject of a long term investment uh, in our children so that they can have opportunities to grow and to be healthy and to learn. So they're gonna they're gonna have that high skill uh, that every child should have an opportunity to achieve. And obviously, the we've talked tonight about a lot of those programs, whether it's child care or, or food assistance or uh, the the tax credits that lift up families. So other than those initiatives to help children and families plus workforce development strategies, if there's anything else that you think we should do, I hope you would tell us if, if you want to talk about it tonight or if you, if you want to put it on the table. I mean, I, I believe yeah. it's important to keep the holistic view when we're discussing workforce development. Yep. As we're discussing programs for children, acknowledging the reality that if the adults in the household are not stable, they're unemployed, underemployed, yep. they're not really able to provide their best in supporting their children through that educational journey. So um, absolutely that whole family approach um, and a holistic approach to, to just assisting individuals to get to work. Um, any program specifically to bring ahead our black, brown, and Latino population, yep. um, obviously very needed as well. No, and, and a lot of what we're doing, just to, just to give you one example, this tax credit, child tax credit, which most Americans are aware we've had for years, but we made it substantially more generous. And making that tax credit refundable change will change the lives of a lot of low-income families. Um, and and that's, that, that's a a seismic, really almost revolutionary change in the life of families. And they're, they're going to begin to see it this summer. Um, in uh, probably the month of July, you'll start to see those payments landing. So it'll be dollars in the pockets of a lot of families that have not had that help. And, you know, for some people, they're already complaining about it, uh, that, that, you know, we're, we're, we have a, an American rescue plan that provides a lot of help to low-income families with children and, and, some, and a lot of middle-class families with children. And there's, there's some com complaining about it. And I have to say to those guys in Washington, are you the same people that voted for a, a corporate tax cut that cost the country a trillion and a half dollars? Permanent corporate tax relief for huge multinational corporations? And we all had to pay a trillion and a half dollars to make that possible? And you're complaining that we're helping low-income families, give me a break. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have never had in Washington, at least in the last 40 years, the kind of focused strategy to lift up low-income families, especially low-income families with children. And if what I say to those, the, the rich and the powerful who might be complaining about it, I have one message for them. Get used to it, because we're going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep voting over and over again for supports for families, 
low-income and middle-class families. And if that means the, the wealthy and the powerful and the corporate and the connected have to wait, they're going to wait. And I don't care if they have to wait 100 years. They have had the tax code rigged for 40 years. 40 years they've been rigging that tax code to help people at the top. It's about time struggling working families, and especially those that have kids and trying to make ends meet, it's about time we lifted them up. Absolutely. Thank Tanisha, you. Tanisha, thank, thank you, and thanks for your work. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to continue with Jacqueline. Good afternoon. Great to My be name with you. is Jackie Romero. I'm from El Salvador. I came to this country when I was eight years old. I'm a York County resident and I'm also a FASA member. Um, in this country, we immigrants come to better our lives. We leave our countries at either because of poverty, natural disasters, or violence, unfortunately. We work tirelessly to get a better life and give our best efforts to fit in the society and even work two jobs sometimes um, just to earn dignity and respect through our daily work. We immigrants have been, been in the front lines during this pandemic, even at the expense of our own families, um, putting, ourselves, putting ourselves in danger and also our families. Now, Senator Casey, um, I know that you take our side and know the worth of our contribution to this country. So for that, I thank you. And also allow me to ask an essential question here. Do you recognize that immigrants are essential? And if you do, do you support the budget reconciliation so the uh, so essential workers, DACA and TPS holders can benefit from it and finally get a path to citizenship? Jackie, the short answer is yes. Um, but I, I want to make sure that, that you know that um, as much as you hear a lot of rhetoric in Washington about, about um, uh, the debate about immigration or the debate about DACA, or the debate about what's happened in this pandemic, um, there are a lot of people that hear your voice, uh, and a lot of people who understand that for too long, too many people in Washington haven't been uh, listening to your voice. And being, being willing to stand up and fight for you, and to fight for the, your family and the, the work ethic that you've represented uh, as part of the, the community. So I want to thank you for taking the time to be here tonight and, and to, uh, to tell part of your story. But we have an opportunity now, because folks like you made it possible to, to, uh, to advocate for these policies. I think we're, we're entering a new chapter now when it comes to a lot of these issues that are related. Comprehensive immigration reform, I think, is not only possible, but something that we're going to continue to try to push forward. We couldn't even get a vote on that, as you know, for years. Now we can get votes on big issues like that. The Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA, that, that program, as you know, was the subject of debate for the last couple of years and a lot of heartache and frustration when we didn't make progress. That, the, the bill that deals with DACA is actually bipartisan, believe it or not. There's not much that's you have a Democrat and a Republican and, and several leading that effort. So I, I think this can be the year where we can move forward on immigration reform uh, and making sure there's an, a path to earn citizenship, making sure that we have a guest worker program in place, and do a lot of other things that are, that are essential. And I know there are some people that, that say to me, well, the only thing I care about when it comes to immigration is, you know, what's, who's coming across the border, and they want to talk about um, only about one issue, which is border security. And what I usually say to them is, if you want real border security, the kind that we, sh that, that, that we should have, you, we should invest in uh, fortifying ports of entry when it comes to automobiles and cargo, because that's where the drugs are coming in. The drugs aren't coming in because some guy has it in his pocket and he crosses the border. The drugs are coming in through vehicles and cargo, and we should invest lots of money, and not just millions, billions, in the kind of technology that can detect that so that we can stop the flow of drugs that come through cargo and, and vehicles. But 
the, the most important thing we've got to do is finally, finally begin to work in, in, a, in a bipartisan way to get comprehensive immigration reform done. You know, a lot of people, and you probably don't need all this history, but a lot of people forget it wasn't that long ago that the United States Senate voted. It was only 2013, eight years ago. When the United States Senate got 68 votes for an immigration bill, um, which was comprehensive. The problem was it landed in the House and they refused to vote on it. Um, now it's the other way around. The House, House passes immigration bills all the time and we don't vote on it. But now I think we have a chance uh, to do that. And it's not only important to, to you and your family and folks I know in, in your community and folks throughout our state and even beyond, but it's also important to a lot of other people may not think immigration affects their lives. When we didn't get that bill passed in 2013, we lost a trillion and a half dollars to the United States of America. We lost all that money. We lost the chance to be creating uh, millions of jobs, which we didn't create in those, in those years. So this is the right thing to do for, to be consistent with our values, to be a place that welcomes immigrants, that is, that is open to uh, the, the benefit and the dynamism and the diversity that immigrants provide to our society. But it's also a darn good economic strategy as well to lift up the country because of the work that, that immigrants do. So thanks for being part of the, the community. Thanks for being an example of hard work and sacrifice in the community. And we look forward to getting to know you better and maybe not just from a long distance like tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And we're approaching officially the end and we're going to um, what time is it? It's six ten. So not. I bad, think I'm right? supposed to be here till midnight. Isn't that what someone? <laughs> I think some of the cars want to be here till midnight. We have to deliver that pizza to the cars. Did it arrive yet? <laughs> no. Who was in charge of that? Somebody was in charge of the pizza. <laughs> no, I'm bueno, sorry. Sofia, adelante. Hi, my name is Sofia Portillo. I am from York, and I am a proud member of Casa. As a 17-year-old, climate change is one of my biggest worries. I view it as my duty to ensure that my generation and those to come have clean air and water. But as a Latina, climate justice is one of my biggest passions. Brown and black communities are disproportionately affected by climate change, so it is vital that any climate solution offered on a local, state, or federal level puts these communities first. One of the solutions that I see on a federal level is to pass the Green New Deal as it would address housing, food insecurity, job creation, access to education and health care, and most importantly, clean air and water for all of us. My question to you today is, would you support legislation like the Thrive Act, a legislation that prioritizes climate, jobs, infrastructure, and racial injustice? Yeah, I'm, Thank I'm, you. For, Sophia, first of all, uh, do you say you're you're 17 years old? Yes, I'm 17. <laughs> that is amazing. When I was 17, number one, I I didn't attend any town meetings, town halls. Number one, this is not a hall, but it's out. You know, it's outside. Number two is even if I had attended, I couldn't have asked a question the way you did. It was so articulate and 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 compelling about a big issue. Thank you. So you are in your ability to communicate way ahead of where I was at 17 or 25 or I could go longer. But anyway, so thanks for doing that. Uh, number two is Thrive. This issue came up recently and I haven't, I just haven't uh, taken a close look at it to decide whether it is co-sponsored or not. Mm -hmm. So I've got to do that. So that's something I, I owe you. Um, but thirdly, I'd say that when it comes to combating climate change, um, and dealing with a number of these um, environmental justice issues. We have, you know, in the Senate, you have all these little caucuses that work on issues. There's an environmental justice caucus. I'm a, I happen to be a member of it. We don't meet enough, but we're working on policy you know, that, that focuses on environmental justice. Um, I, I would say that the effort to combat climate change, as well as the effort to focus on uh, environmental justice and, and some of the issues you're talking about uh, are going to be the subject of this jobs plan the president outlined because this isn't just a, a rebuilding roads and bridges and other infrastructure this is a, a bill that he's outlined 
to try to combat climate change uh, and create a lot of jobs in the process. And that's, a lot of people want to talk about climate change mitigation or strategies as being separate from job creation. It's actually one and the same. And the fact that the president moved up the goals yesterday for 2030 puts even more weight on that, that jobs program. And I know you're cold because of the wind. Let me just say finally, we have to recognize when it comes to climate change that it is real, it is caused by human activity, it is a threat not just to the earth, the God's creation, it's a threat to human life. A lot, of, a lot of people will die if we don't do something about climate change, we know that. And the fourth thing that should be, I think, evident to everyone is we've got to do something about it. I think the jobs plan is a good start on it and would, would push us in the right direction. We may need to do more than that, whether it's Thrive or some other, some other initiatives, but you have your finger on maybe the most urgent challenge our country and our world faces, and I appreciate your willing to bring your voice uh, to it uh, at the age of 17. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the folks who asked questions. Thank you to everyone who attended. This concludes today's town hall, and I'm going to share the floor with you, turn it over to you so you can share your closing remarks. Well, Thaisa, I, I can't believe how good a job you did as an MC. Do you do this professionally all the time? I, I try. Not necessarily <laughs> my, my number one job, but... I, I do it every now and then. <laughs> well, what, I did, what I didn't say at the beginning is not, not just thank you for, for doing this, but thank you for all the ways you serve the community. I know you serve not only um, York and, and the, the, the county, but you serve the state as well, right, as a member of the Governor's Commission? That's right. Yeah. And I want to make sure I, I remember when that commission was created way back in the 1980s, but what's the formal name of it now, the commission? It's a Governor's Advisory Commission, Advisory Commission on Latino Affairs. On Latino Affairs, okay. I think it might have had that, the same name back in, um, in the 80s, but it's, um, it's critical that we have um, the work that you do. So thanks for doing that. And thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. I was only kidding about the pizza delivery. That will have to be at another mean? meeting. But um, can we just hear someone's horns just to say, um, not to saying about me, just to say... Let's, that's good. I think that, I think that noise bodes well for getting the American Jobs Plan passed and the American Families Plan, when we hear about it this week, getting those two passed. If we do those two things this year, in addition to a lot of other work, we're going to move our country forward, put this pandemic behind us, lift the economy out of the ditch, and move forward as a people. Thank you, York County. God bless you. Thank you.